Mr. Matt Jones from Eltham. Uh, he's uh, going to go over secure SDLC speedrun. He's been doing this for over 10 years. Uh, this, I mean, application security like Kung Fu, if I want to call it that. Um, and he's going to give you a quick intro to SDLC, talking through managing threats for code you wrote and the code that you were managing. And also some examples around wiping out entire classes of vulnerabilities and a lot, lot more. Uh, open your minds, get ready. Mr. Matt, thank you. Good round of applause. Hello, you can hear me right in the back? All right, cool. Um, thanks. <laughs> nice. Nice mood lighting. Okay. All right. <laughs> so this is the coolest looking slide in the entire deck, and then it goes downhill from here. Um, I'm a partner at Eltham. We're a small security boutique. Um, I've been doing security for a while, since a teenager, um, when I had thorough set of hair, and now it's descended as I've been doing security for like about 15 years now. Um, and Eltham specializes in white box assessments. So uh, white box just basically means we read a lot of code. Um, we also do training and we do CTFs. So that's our main area. Um, previously before Eltham, um, I worked um, doing threat management. I worked as a so uh, security operations analyst um, and probably read pretty much every single type of source code possible um, from low level kernel codes where you find a vulnerability and some guy with a beard runs in shaking his fist to a JavaScript developer who that's all they know. Um, and we, um, earlier this year, we decided to start running workshops in our uh, Collingwood office. So we basically set up a meetup group and we've been inviting people in to teach them about secure SDLCs. Um, so this is a condensed version of that talk um, and trying to take some of the more key points away. So, uh, introduction. So, this is a very general trend at this conference and also in the industry in the last few years, which is basically about the whole concept of security as an audit function is quite antiquated. Um, how do we build things in? It's the developer's responsibility, and that's what OWASP and so on is about. Um, and there's really two sides of things. One is the developers themselves, and the second one is the business and, and um, changing the, uh, the traditional approach of risk management and instead being a bit more aligned to threat management, um, thinking things through holistically and so on. And one thing which I thought about for a really long time, and I saw it from um, Halva from Google, which is about people speak about the security poverty line, but in reality, when you see an engineering poverty line that really, when companies don't treat uh, quality of engineering well, that, that really affects the security of things. So when I saw this quote, I had to throw it in. Um, and having worked, um, we, as I said before, we do white box reviews. So we um, work a lot with developers. Um, we get in early. We um, kind of try to co be collaborative, basically. And in that sense, you see a lot of different types of maturity over different, different areas. So here's some of the maturity differentiators I think are more, more key. Um, the first one is culture. And if you walk in as, as um, a security professional and you see that basically it, you being there is a pain, um, that's on the very bad end of things. On this other side of things, the companies who actually treat security where they see it as a feature for the business itself, they want to be able to advertise it as um, one of their distinguishers in, uh, for what they do. Um, the second thing is assurance and how they approach security assurance. So that um, quote before about um, security as an uh, audit function is quite antiquated. So testing being outsourced via black box method. So basically black box pen testing where you're just doing a, at release or just before production or maybe in production um, penetration tests to catch weaknesses. And this is the common pattern where uh, forever it ends up in risk acceptance and a bunch of vendor mitigations being plugged in front of it. Um, and then on the other end, where you just see things being very collaborative, embedded, and very layered based on threat models. So if you're in the last talk, that kind of trying to rationalize what's most important with. 
Uh, the third thing is tech debt. So basically tech debt just rots um, and you have this huge backlog of all these issues and they never get played up. Um, or they're in a risk register and they just sit there and for, forever. Um, on the other thing, people, uh, some companies we work with, it's always just about quality and they want clean, reliable, secure source code. Um, and um, it's a huge spectrum between the, the, the bad case and the good case here. And the final one is leadership. So um, uh, basically when you see people running around leaderships, running at the latest fads, um, it's a really bad sign. Um, and on the flip side of things, um, people who just keep it simple first. And if, I, if you're trying to do something with AI or you're trying to do something like that, you maybe want to sit back for a year or two and see how it plays out in the industry and then hire the person who did it really badly and failed, and then they did it really well because they learned their lesson. And um, so and th those are the four main distinguishers. And already I've been at this conference. This is my first OWASP ever talking. Um, and I've seen so many acronyms, and I've been doing this for a while. I don't recognize half of them. So um, if you think about all the different types of solutions, there's um, different types of web scanners, application firewalls, OWASP top 10. There's, which one's that? Signal sciences, um, check marks, static analysis. You have um, maturity frameworks. You have scorecards, you have certified penetration testing, and you have things like bug bounties. And um, the point of this talk in general is to try to put a bit of context in regards to like how do you, where do you start thinking about this problem? Um, how do you start to chew, um, work out how to make informed decisions about what goes where? And for security strategy 101, what I've seen for as long as I've been in this industry is basically um, people. CISOs taking heaps of money to conferences at RSA in San Francisco. They walk through the vendor hall, they get swayed in this direction. They spend a fortune on some vendor products and then they spend years trying to actually implement it into their process. Um, it just doesn't work. So um, the SDLC priorities um, here, which I talk about, is aligned with threat modeling concepts as well. So trying with the, a few goals, trying to make applications resilient to attack, um, designing for UX and user privacy, um, readiness for tomorrow, um, and considering potential internal threats as well. So um, <clears throat> the framework which I am focusing this talk around mostly is from Microsoft. Um, and the reason why is because uh, kind of about 18 years ago, they, got, um, they were kind of like the laughing stock of security. Um, and they transformed that around quite incredibly. Um, if you think about application development, Windows is probably the biggest application around. And um, so from 2004, they had Service Pack 2, where they started to, around this time, there were a few people from Microsoft, Windows Schneider, who's now at Intel. Um, and um, they wrote a book on threat modeling. They were doing, Michael Howard released a book on secure code, and they were really trying to change the way they did security back then. Um, also, threat modeling, you, would, you may have heard of things such as Stride and Dread. And um, Stride and Dread came out of, um, in the 90s, there were a bunch of papers on attack trees, so basically threat modeling concepts, which are, if I'm going to perform this attack, I need to have some primitives, and I need to... Um, you know, if I'm attacking a Windows service, for example, I need to find a memory corruption exploit against, I don't know, um, um, IIS or whatever, and then I'm going to get access to the system, and, and this is my attack tree I'm defining. Um, they took these concepts from some papers, and they defined um, Stride and Dread in the late 90s, and they started using it on Windows, and that was the reason they started doing it. So after a few years, they started to mature pretty quickly because they started to um, get a grasp of it. And now Windows 10 is considered one of the most secure operating systems in the world. Um, but it's not perfect. And, um, and one of the things which this talk is about is people talk about application security like you have to get it perfect. And, and what this is trying to put into context is about realistic threat models as well. So, um, who's seen this? And it's a dark room, so I probably can't see your response. <laughs> um, okay, so 
All right, so this is the waterfall standard and um, uh, Microsoft Secure SDLC, and they have this on their website, and it's very general. Um, it's also very Microsoft aligned, um, but in general it covers um, uh, activities you can apply throughout the development process. And um, if we were to try to cross-reference what um, some of these terms and acronyms we hear about today, Traditionally, we ran a penetration test or we run a bug bounty is at the very end when you release your software into production. And, um, and if there's a breach, then it's like, all right, this is really bad. What can we do to, to, what can we do to respond? And basically, this talk is about how can we optimize this, uh, this process here. But realistically, that's a very agile, or that's a very waterfall approach. And um, their, agile, um, their agile SDO is actually quite useful and quite um, quite practical. So um, the idea is that you have one-time activities, things that you invest in upfront. Um, it's mostly around your requirements and your design. After this, you have bucket activities. These are things you do periodically. These are things where this um, verification, dynamic analysis, or DAST, um, and so on and so on and so on, um, or fuzzing. And I kind of consider when that previous talk about running things like Zap or Burp Suite, that's where it fits into this process as well. And finally, um, per sprint activities, which are basically your ongoing day-to-day -day activities, things that you can do without much friction, hopefully, um, and um, they give you as much benefit as they can possibly do without being a pain. Um, they also define maturity levels, so basically moving from being react reactive to proactive, and then you can go as far as you want to go. And this is mostly focusing on just moving to being proactive, what I'm talking about today. Now, if I think about focusing on key threats and going back to the threat modeling concept. Um, now, it's funny being at OWASP, and then I'll be making fun of the OWASP top 10. But um, basically, an application pen tester, if you think about it, the, the OWASP top 10 encompasses it has 10 things listed out, injection attacks and cross-site scripting and misconfigurations, data exposure, configuration problems, known vulnerabilities and software you use. Actually, that's a lot of stuff. Um, it's a, these are all quite general categories. And if you throw this to a developer or even to a security tester, it's very hard to prioritize. Um, and if you think about threats to the applications you make, um, how much is this actually covering in terms of realistic threats? And it feels like when you basically just um, bang away at all these different test cases from a black box perspective, it's, it's really hard to gauge is this effective or not. So the general thing I'm trying to align with is the ASD's essential aid. So um, ASD's essential aid is, they used to be the top four, but basically it was if you're an enterprise or an organization, you're trying to protect your yourself from real security threats, you should probably only focus on a few things first before worrying about anything else. Because again, similar to what I was saying about um, security officers going to conferences and spending money on everything that's really flashy, um, it's very easy to kind of get distracted and not focus on what's important. So then, thanks, man. Um, so um, going back to this diagram here. Now, if you have a threat actor, a threat actor being um, someone who's sophisticated or opportunistic, an insider, whatever it is, doesn't matter. Um, we present to them attack surface and exposures. And, um, and they want to meet an objective. So maybe they want to get access to personal, um, personal information for your customers. Maybe they want to steal secrets out of your source code and get access to infrastructure. Maybe they're just trying to find a common vulnerability class and exploit it and do whatever they can. So they're very opportunistic. Whatever the case, um, we need to think about what capabilities the actor has, the opportunity we present to them, and then the motive for them to want to do that objective. And then if, um, for us, we want to understand the capability, we want to limit the opportunity, and then we just kind of want to consider the motive. So if I go to this scenario where you have a bug bounty. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> So if we run through this, you, um, what exposures do we actually present? So this, this bug bounty hunter might have targeted reconnaissance, and they have um, persistent testing of a vector. So a vector being maybe, for example, 
maybe there's like um, some test infrastructure on the on the internet, and um, via reconnaissance of this organization, they found this test server. It's running some outdated Spring server or Tomcat or whatever. And I'm going to try to breach that. I'm going to try to get access to that server, get code execution, get a shell on that server. Now, the objective, the motive of that is actually to get paid a bounty. And they might spend a day on that, maybe two days, but then they might get 20,000 USD. Now, if we go back to... And then this is where we talk about economics. So there's economics behind attackers. Um, so we have there our little visual Visio laptop, and um, then we hit the internet boundary where we have a network exposure. And then behind that, we might have our application stack. Behind that, we have our application and integrations. And maybe we have a bunch of SaaS tools, which are on the internet boundary as well. We have our attacker on the internet. Um, we have our internal attackers, so maybe someone who's got access to the corporate network. And we have the corpnet boundary, so we have um, you know, our users on our, on our network. Now, the reason why there is a gradient is because, like that red to yellow, is because the expo what we present from an exposure point of view, um, the difficulty and the techniques and the, uh, requires different capability and different, very, very, very different motives. So what we want to try to do is, from an exposure point of view, limit these very critical exposures so those cheap things are basically void and non-existent. And that means it depends on what the objective is of the attacker. So, so getting started, um, I want to talk about this thing called DevOpsec, which um, it's basically getting things off the internet. <laughs> um, and if someone said, what does your internet um, infrastructure look like? Or if I ask the question, they might say, come back and say, yeah, well, we use AWS, we have some Nginx web servers, we're behind some load balancers, we use struts, Tomcat, you know, normal stuff. And it's a really small footprint. And in reality, when you look at it, um, they have all their dev and test infrastructure on the internet, just with these funny subdomains. They have their CI, CD tools online as well. Maybe they have Jenkins online. They have a gazillion SaaS products and just general just dragons everywhere. Um, this is the most common thing which I see and which a lot of security professionals see. And um, the first question is for a room which is mostly dev focused, I think. How many people recognize this, this tool? Sweet. So um, Sheridan is like Google for bad people who want to exploit things on the internet. And um, basically, for those who didn't raise their hand, you can type in stuff like, I want to see webcams in this country, or I want to see um, strut servers in Australia, whatever, Te things running Telnet. And it's amazingly effective. It's got full APIs. This is just one of quite a few tools which are actually quite good at mapping out infrastructure. And who here is familiar with Multigo? So Multigo is um, it's developed, it's been developed for about 15 years, roughly, um, by a South African company called Perturba. And um, basically, you can throw in a domain, and it has all these modules, which will very slowly um, run these modules. So you might start with an entity like a domain, and it'll get, it will then run DNS queries and whois lookups, and it will perform a bunch of other stuff, and it will keep gr growing this data model. And um, it'll get down to the point where if I have an image streaming from Twitter for their official account, it'll check for geo coordinates and stuff in it as well, and it'll keep going. Um, and then you'll map out infrastructure. It's really easy to run. It's quite useful. And who here is familiar with certificate transparency logs? So when you have a developer and they spin up um, some, you know, super secret dev test infrastructure dot whatever, your company dot com, um, it is sometimes quite common to see them um, show up in certificate transparency logs. So if you go to um, put in your domain here, um, this, this particular website is by Google, but if you put this domain, you'll get to see all the SSL certificates which have been registered, which means that those things sometimes aren't as um, anonymized as what you might think. And this is, yeah, this is, I think, step number one is to focus on this. 
The second thing is um, about code you build on. And if you think about, um, let's assume we have a really simple web service and the web service is just spitting back some JSON data to us. We send a request and it's like, um, you know, curly brackets, okay. Um, now, that might just be a few lines of code which we write, but to make that happen and make that actually in production, it's built upon layers and layers and layers of code, trillions of lines of code. From the framework we build on to the web server we're running it on to even through the load balancer, down to the container which we're running it in, down to the kernel, or like the operating system, to the hypervisor, and it keeps going. Um, and so actually most of the code in our applications aren't, isn't actually code we write. So, um, and obviously there's different types of frameworks. You have your low or no code frameworks, which are basically things like WordPress, all the way down to your no frameworks, which is things like C, embedded C. Um, or even Java and Python without any framework supplies here as well. Now, this puts a huge dependency on us for having really good vulnerability management. I'll talk more about the role of frameworks and secure frameworks in a bit. But who here recognizes this screenshot? Okay, so um, this is Metasploit. And Metasploit is, has been around since around the mid-2000s. Um, and basically what this is, is it's a very simple uh, command line. You can also get a GUI, but it's a very simple tool where you can say, I want to run an exploit against a target. And um, it's got a very steady workload in regards to commits which are going into this project. It's maintained by thousands of people. And whenever there's a new vulnerability, um, Quite often, the exploitability of that issue will go, how, is, how hard is it? Can we write an exploit to take advantage of this flaw? And this, this abstracts that process into a consistent way. So this framework, basically, uh, well, this example here is there's a struts Jakarta vulnerability, and it's running on this target web server. And I say, this is the target web server I want to attack. And I want to just start a shell for me to interact with the server once it works. And so all you do is you go select your exploit, run, and that's your shell. And then the same applies for, I mean, I think this is Rails, a Rails vulnerability. This is a JBoss vulnerability. And the point is, is that um, patch management in terms of frameworks is pretty critical now because these, this presents to us almost like an application agnostic attack surface. Um, so with that said, um, we have the frameworks themselves and then we have dependency checking. How, how are we actually going to keep on top of um, all the dependencies we, which we actually build our applications on? Um, who is me with things such as NVD, CVE, and so on? So I'll quickly summarize these acronyms. If you've ever seen like CVE-2018-123456, that's what I'm talking about here. Um, NVD is just uh, the National Vulnerability Database. Again, it was started around the mid-2000s. Um, they basically wanted to, this is, it's a US government initiative. They basically wanted to um, keep a database on all the vulnerabilities that were happening against different types of software, whether it's an operating system or an application, whatever. A CVE is, is common vulnerability and exposure, which is an entry in that database. Um, CWE is the weakness type, so it might be like a SQL injection or a buffer overflow or a misconfiguration. Um, CPE is the, is the actual thing that was affected. So it might be something like Mozilla, Firefox, 12.0.1, and so on. And CVSS is a scoring system, which is basically a bunch of numbers factoring in, is this hard to exploit? Is there a patch available? Is it a remote attack? Do I get full privileges and all that sort of stuff? So that's the quick rundown. But dependency checking is the idea where and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this, but hopefully this brings some context. We make our, make our Java bar, it's a bit fuzzy, no, it's right. Um, okay. um, so we make our Java file, and then when we, when we, write, our, when we um, write our code, it includes all these third-party dependencies. And in Java, for example, we'll have... Um, our list of dependencies, which is things like, you know, things like MySQL connect to Java, and it will then um, take that, um, that item from our dependency list 
It will look at the version number, and then it will download the NVD database, and it will basically say, do we have any matches here? And it uses like this XML style schema. Um, this project has been around for so long, um, and there's a lot of commercial tools, and there's a lot of variants to it, but that's in general how this type of thing works. Um, this is me running it against the project, where this is as part of one of our training, training labs for Java, and it basically goes, oh, we have these matches on the dependencies you have with NVD, and these are the CVs which are applicable. And for this particular lab, we had this um, particular um, Jackson XML um, JSON passing library, which was vulnerable, um, which it has a pretty bad uh, remote code execution vulnerability in it. So hopefully that explains CV a bit. The nice thing about it, though, is things like GitHub are starting to do this as well for you. So um, this, you can see here on the left, we're in dependency graph, um, which then says, hey, I've already looked at your code automatically for you, and this is your vulnerable dependencies. Um, and also, as of about two days ago, um, they've also got these alerts. So now they will start to alert you on, um, like, actually quite bad, so, um, like your spring... Um, Spring Framework has got this moderate severity vulnerability on it. So it can either be in your IDE or your build process or actually done for you automatically when you have your stuff in GitHub. Next one is framework security controls. So I was basically talking about the, how important it is to patch your framework and keep track of your dependencies, but um, also understanding the responsibilities um, of security boundaries. And this diagram tries to show that the way you don't no longer have a Linux server which runs Tomcat, which has your application on it. It's actually a lot more complex to that, um, than that now. And Docker diagram is actually a really good way of showing this, I think, which is um, you have your host operating system, or host OS on the right, with your hypervisor, and then you have you know, all your different containers. The thing which is interesting about um, these, these security boundaries is they actually, each um, layer tries to protect itself from the, tries to protect the layers above it. So if I have a hypervisor, um, which is maybe whatever, it's VMware, it's um, Hyper-V for Windows, if I get arbitrary code execution in um, the guest, um, guest system, it's actually quite expensive for me to break out for it if you're keeping a system patched. Um, for Hyper-V, the exploit for that is over $100,000. Um, and then when you go up to Docker, if you can configure Docker reasonably, breaking out of Docker is, again, expensive as well. And then when you go into application frameworks, they've got a slightly different responsibility, which is how do I not have it so developers shoot themselves in the foot with stupid vulnerabilities and misconfigurations? And that's where people say secure frameworks, basically. And I think things break down a lot when trying to educate developers because um, this is from the OWASP guidance on SQL injection. And I've, I haven't seen a construct like that in so long. Like, people don't write vulnerable SQL like that anymore. It's abstracted away by frameworks, and there's all these different edge cases which can happen. Um, so I think when people warn about general vulnerability classes, they trivialize it too much and doesn't really get taken seriously. Um, so they say, Psst, I use, um, like, whatever, Hibernate. Um, but actually, in reality, there's heaps of edge cases. So I want to summarize a few edge cases. So this, this function is actually demonstrating um, a vulnerability class where I'm deliberately making the application vulnerable. And there was a vulnerability class which pretty much trampled every single web framework called um, External Entity Injection, or XXE. And basically what it allowed was um, tricking the XML parser to then resolve entities. And you could do stuff like, um, hey, can you reference this file in the file system and then give it back to me in the response? And then the XML pass will go, sure, I'll read that for you and send it back in the response. And this devastated pretty much everything, like Spring, PHP, Java, um, .NET. Pretty much every framework was vulnerable to this because it supported this external entity resolution by default. And 
It's been, so most frameworks have basically said, we'll turn this off by default unless you want to explicitly make yourself vulnerable to it. Which means that to fix this, eradicate this vulnerability class completely is that you just have to run a, a relative in the last three or so years, um, this, this um, XML parser. And what I see is stuff like this on Twitter. And someone claiming a $5,000 bounty for finding um, uh, XXE vulnerability. Um, and so it takes maybe a few minutes to, to test and verify this once you find a vulnerable endpoint. And then when you see this actually happening quite often, and it's quite an avoidable problem. So um, frameworks can very easily kill entire vulnerability classes if you keep them up to date as well. Um, second thing is unsafe functions. And um, I had the SQL injection um, example before, but this is, um, you can see this um, on the bottom right, this JPA sort, unsafe. And this is J J um, the Java Persistence API. And actually, it's very hard to have SQL injection in this layer. They basically label, if you need to do something really funky, it's then dot .unsafe. And most, um, most modern frameworks will actually st are starting to label um, this is bad behavior, and now it's called things like dangerous, dangerously set in HTML or, you know, sort dot unsafe or insecure or whatever. And um, what, what happens is basically these frameworks are saying, we want you to actually um, explicitly have to type out this is incredibly dangerous and unsafe for it to be vulnerable. And the final thing, which uh, final example um, about code we write is moving the problem. And this is actually the more common way of finding SQL injection nowadays, which is when people are moving their code from their .NET, Java, Rails, Node, whatever application to backend or, or just to a completely different um, component, which is um, this is in some stored procedure where you actually have the SQL injection there. And that's quite common if maybe developers change or they want to performance reason or scalability reasons or whatever. Um, so for code we write, sniffing out very bad stuff, um, SAST is this um, topic which you'll hear quite a bit today. Um, it's very easy to apply. Most languages actually allow you to, um, to run some form of static analysis. The static analysis, though, is a really complex area. And... Um, uh, it can get really expensive really fast because a lot of the vendor solutions have a lot of engineering work behind them. But then also the free options are actually pretty reasonable now as well. So um, it goes from essentially like grep or grep on steroids to um, very, very complex, um, complex systems which are trying to find vulnerabilities. My recommendation is... Um, this is running um, SonaQ with fine sec bugs on a Java application. And I filtered them out and said, I only want to see very high severity vulnerabilities. So traditionally, people complain about noise and false positives in static analysis, and they, they just don't use them sometimes because of that. But actually, if you do some very basic filtering, you'll get stuff that is very genuine and very bad. So th these are command injection vulnerabilities. Th this is code that just shouldn't exist in applications. This is a directory traversal vulnerability, which is very valid. It's very easy to pick off some very bad constructs. Now, I'm going to pick on this again, but um, I saw this, and I couldn't believe it, where basically someone's gone and they've claimed $19,000 for finding about a dozen or two dozen instances of system. And system is basically you pass some data into it, and the operating system will run it. And obviously, some, something's been reviewed, and they, they exploded the vulnerability. They then stole all the source code, and then they ran static analysis on it. So they ran this, and then they reported them one by one to the vendor, and they got paid $19,000. And from me, from reading source code, like doing proper secure code reviews, this is not much time. If you had some code drop in front of you, or if you're a developer and you know this is bad, you might be able to kill these in like an hour. You know, so that's a lot of money. That's a $19,000 hour, um, hourly rate, basically. Um, and the reason, it, reason it's dangerous, this type of um, 
finding every single instance of it as opposed to trying to find patterns or problems is because um, this is kind of what the pen testing industry did a long time ago. We can find more vulnerabilities than you. We can, uh, um, versus our competitors, for example. And for me or for a lot of other people who do this type of work, you might actually group this stuff where this, these command injections, maybe there's 20 here, we will group these three as very critical because there's no authentication required and they're very easy to exploit. We'll, we'll group these 12 because maybe as a medium because it's really dangerous but it's post-exploitation, which probably would be a high. But you wouldn't just say your report wouldn't have 20 vulnerabilities. Um, you'd probably group them together because there's the same fundamental reason why they're there in the first place. And you see a lot. You see a lot of this type of advertising happening. We'll find more critical issues, but it's it's kind of crazy. And if you're confused about application security, because you see this type of marketing today, um, or just in general, um, for me it's confusing as well. Um, it feels like the last few years, um, application security and trying to understand what to do is getting more and more confusing. Um, it reminds me of US politics, Australian politics. It feels like back to the future sometimes, probably in the last few years, where um, I think it's just because it's such an opportunistic market as well. Um, so it's not just that you shouldn't really be worried about attackers as much as the vendors in this space. <laughs> So, um, so moving away from remote attacks to insiders and kind of getting towards the end, but I'm, we talked about a few things only so far. Risks of logging is actually something which I see pretty much every single review I've ever done be having this issue. And the threat's really simple. We have a, we've spent so much time trying to secure our applications um, from external attack and we try to we encrypt it, we, we prevent vulnerabilities, we encrypt it in the database, in, tran in transit, um, and then we'll log everything to maybe like Sumo Logic um, in the cloud. And if you think about the, the attack here, um, your employees, anyone with access to that cloud logging platform, or if an attacker was to enumerate your email addresses and find previous passwords using haveibeenpwned.com and then try to get access to your cloud logging platform, it's actually a pretty feasible attack. And depending on what you log, um, it can be the same as hacking, basically. So um, Twitter earlier this year had to reset everyone's passwords because they were logging your password when you were changing your password. Um, and even in this advisory, they say GitHub made a similar announcement earlier this week. It's really, really, really common. Um, and the same applies for secrets. Um, and the same applies for secrets. It's slightly more complicated, though, because um, same problem. You're hard baking secrets or keys into your source code. But the threat model is actually really interesting because insiders or people who hack into um, an endpoint, someone leaves their laptop, unencrypted laptop on a train, and it has your source code pulled to it um, with AWS like prod keys sitting um, in the source code. They can then start to orchestrate your production infrastructure. They can then start to um, gain access to very sensitive data. And it's very easy to go to GitHub, go to Google, and actually grab this stuff out and find people who are doing, um, who are doing this type of problem. Um, fortunately, um, GitHub and other places are actually trying to prevent this now. This is only like the past week. They realized how much of a crazy problem this is. So um, the platforms you're using for code, writing your code and deploying your code, are trying to detect this stuff now as well. But there's lots of tools to use as well if you want to try that. Um, the most effective testing. So um, from my experience looking at this for a while now is um, basically trying to mimic basic security testing as part of QA. Um, and it comes with a bit of a catch. It, the catch is there's quite a bit of domain knowledge to get up to speed with. But fortunately, um, it's not that hard to get up to speed nowadays, thanks to resources like Pentester Lab. Louis, who makes this, is in the other room, um, talking about JWTs, which is one of his exercises. But 
one of the um, best results I've seen for QA testers and testers in general, getting up to speed with concepts and learning how to exploit vulnerabilities and what to look for. Um, point, them, point them here, and um, it's free. You can also sign up to it and get like, access to more stuff, but a lot of it is free. It's very well done, um, and there's full boot camps as well. But it, basically, how do you have it so your testers actually understand some basic security principles and what they look like in practice? Running self-assessment tools um, is very easy to do as well. There's a lot of automation that can be done, but um, allocating time to do this. Um, SSL testing, um, CSP or content security policy or security header testing, these are things which um, take a few minutes to do. Um, I would recommend for your internet uh, footprint, just for a free tool that is quite powerful, is Spiderfoot, um, which um, Maltiga was actually the two creators of this we're good friends years ago, and they both created their separate tools. Spiderfoot's um, made by an Australian guy, a guy from Melbourne, who now lives in Switzerland, and he puts quite a lot of effort into this tool. Um, it's quite good at mapping things out. It's free. Um, and there's a bunch of tools for looking for secrets and keys. So those are the main things which I wanted to talk about, and I think I'm almost out of time, but I'm just going to recap the main 12 simple tricks. So first one is... Documenting anywhere, it doesn't matter where. Um, confluence, um, a napkin, a notepad, text file, it doesn't matter. Just um, basically going to the Microsoft website. OpenSAM is another project from OWASP that has is reason, is, it's worth checking out as well. But you just want to have the structure and say, what am I doing for the different phases? There's the Agile SDL as well. The second one is supporting a development culture. So basically having it so you want to shift that bar for security culture and have it as it's a thing that people talk about. Create a Slack channel. Find some people who want to be security champions. There's a few references in this in regard, which are focused just on security champions. Um, if they're new to security, send them to the Pentester Lab Bootcamp, and it's very easy to follow and it's very good. Um, make sure that no matter what, your Security defects or issues aren't separate from your normal development process. They should be tied into JIRA or um, VSO or Rally or whatever it is you might use. Um, but it should be the same workflow, same process. Tracking your frameworks and dependencies, there's a lot of options. And I have, these are just a few screenshots, a few uh, logos, but there's heaps to choose from and I have them in the references. Um, no matter what language you're building on, there is probably some sort of static analysis tool, and they usually have flags which say, give me only the most important stuff first and with stuff with high confidence. So I'd recommend turning it all, everything off. Um, don't spend any money initially. Like, um, use the free tools to actually get that process there and stiff your code up. And then um, turn the most severe things on first and then go from there. Um, Having um, as part of your release QA process, um, can, this works in Agile as well, having a few basic checklists, things to do internally. You can automate a lot of this, but do it manually initially. Um, as part of working on this workshop, um, not this talk, but the, light, the longer workshop, um, I did a lot of reading on secure SDLC stuff, and there's a handful of very good presentations. So um, this is into, um, Laura Bell also wrote a book on agile um, secure development, um, which is really good. She's a New Zealander. Um, this is quite a good talk as well from someone from PwC. Um, this is from some people from Slack about secure development. Um, Small is beautiful is a brilliant talk by someone from Google. Um, they um, this is about attack surface reduction. So it's about eliminating code so you have less, less things to worry about basically. Um, these are the references I was talking about. Um, my closing thoughts for this talk is basically security, I just think, is it's just a part of quality, software quality. We're not trying to make perfect systems. We're trying to make systems resilient to likely abuse from likely adversaries. Um, you want to have a culture where people are asking internally, what do you think could go wrong here? And... Um, if you see a solution as part of security and it's completely black box and it's spot fixing problems, um, stop and think about how you could do it differently. Um, we're looking at releasing a tool to help create these base SDLs with <coughs> considerations. 
And that's it. That's my talk. Um, Oh, you've got plenty of time, actually. Any questions? Yeah, so if you want, you can probably go, but we've got a few minutes, so you can probably go back over the videos so that everyone can take some photos yeah, sure. or, or something like that. So, any other questions? The next one? Hey. Yep, um, I have the longer version on the Eltham slideshare. It go, actually it goes for a couple of hours of me rambling, and this is me condensing it to like 40 minutes. Um, but I'll put this one up as well. So, yep, more questions? Yeah, thanks. Uh, we're still talking about Microsoft SDL 3 model. Are you aware of any assessments for that? Do you apply criteria? Not really. On the back. Uh, it's a good question. I stole that from Google, but I probably hadn't done it before. Um, I guess they mean that um, we're just writing raw code with no framework, right? Um, but um, yeah, it's a Thanks. Enjoy. Fantastic.